Now we will begin worship together with our personal meditation. I, who erewhile the happy garden sung by one man's disobedience lost, now sing recovered paradise to all mankind by one man's firm obedience fully tried through all temptation and the tempter foiled in all his wiles, defeated and repulsed and Eden raised in the waste of wilderness. Our prelude this morning will not be what was originally in the bulletin since we are not worshiping the sanctuary today. Instead, I will be playing the prelude that Linda had recorded for us for two weeks ago. We will listen to that beautiful rendition once again this week. I would now invite Mike Costco to lead us in our call to worship. I can actually say it out knowing that there's nobody in the sanctuary this time, but it is good to see everybody. Glad that everybody's here this morning. I know I said last Christmas, you know, we uh, we take a hit once in a while, but it doesn't take our heart and doesn't take our souls. So it's good to be all here together with you all this time. And please join me in our call to worship. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Those who call on God will be delivered. God will protect those who know God's name. With long life, God will satisfy them and show them God's salvation. Let us worship our great and giving God together. Our first hymn today is What Wondrous Love Is This? The lyrics will be on the screen for you to see.
to confession today. Are you thirsty for grace? Are you hungry for mercy? God is calling. Come to the waters. God's love for you made manifest in Christ never changes or shifts. Our time of confession humbles us, releases our own guilt and shame, the ways we miss the mark and sin against God and one another. Trusting in God's grace and love, let us confess our sin first in unison and then in the silence of our own hearts. Please join with me with our unison prayer of confession. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride. We see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected in justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to the paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Friends, God's love has been poured into your hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. With this love comes new life. Your old one is gone and your new life has begun. Friends, know that you are loved and forgiven and be at peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, hearing and knowing the truth that we are forgiven and made new and so loved by God, let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. The peace of our, our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. With you. This would ordinarily be when we have our time of special music. I just wanted to say to Cindy, thank you for being willing to sing today. And uh, we are sure we will love to hear your solo sometime in the future, which means we will continue on with our unison prayer of elimination led by Elder Costco. Please join me as we get into God's word for us today with our prayer from elimination. Which is God in the wilderness, guide us by your word to these 40 days and minister to us through your Holy Spirit, so that we may be reformed, restored, and renewed. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is from Paul's writings to the Romans, in chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. The word is near you, on your lips, and in our heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified. One confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We God, we thank him and praise for the reading of his holy word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike, for being the liturgist with me today. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. The temptation of Jesus occurs directly after his baptism. So by action, it goes, tempt, goes baptism, temptation. But Luke takes a slight pause in the action to insert the genealogy of Jesus between these two really pivotal early ministry moments for Jesus. So that has just happened. The genealogy has just finished. So now let us jump in to our text for today, the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter four. 
Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days. And when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you, I will give their glory and all this authority. For it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Holy God, you shape this world and all of us within it. Guide us, God, to your side so that we can always find the courage and strength to resist temptation. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Welcome to Lent. Welcome to the church season that means spring is almost here. Welcome to the first Sunday of March, which also means that spring is almost here. Welcome to the Sunday focused on temptation, which doesn't mean spring is almost here. Instead, it's just the lectionary start to the Lenten season. Now Lent, has a fascinating history that links back to the medieval church. Not quite the early church, but a significantly early part of the church calendar so that it became an important part of the church calendar before too many centuries of Christian history had happened. Now, the origins of Lent come from the practice of new converts taking time to prepare for their baptism which always happened once a year at the Easter vigil in the dawn hours of Easter Sunday. The soon to be baptized had all sorts of preparations they'd have to do before their baptism day. Eventually, the practices of the pre-baptized became wider practiced. And then after that, the priests, bishops, and other church officials decided to make the special time of fasting a set time frame. So everybody did the same thing at the same time. No one could have the upper hand advantage at that point, so to say. Those church leaders decided that 40 days seemed like a good biblical number of days to fast. I mean, in our reading today, that's what Jesus does, right? But then somebody brought up the question of Sundays. Sundays aren't to be considered fast days because they're all, every Sunday is a mini resurrection day. So plenty of church leaders argued that they couldn't fast on those days. Eventually they came to the agreement that Lent would be 40 days excluding Sundays, which means Lent, if you were to count the actual number of days, is actually 47 days long, including Sundays. And I hope you found that at least mildly interesting because I did when I learned that information doing a research project in grad school. 
I'm a slide history nerd. So learning where different traditions come from fascinates me most of the time. If you were bored out of your mind and you went into daydream land, I hope you'll come back to us now and I'll try not to bore you again so deeply, though I make no promises. Because the sermon, I have to tell you, it was always a nice break to take a little mind break. So if, that, if you have to do that today, I understand. But I hope you'll come back to us. So anyway, like I said, back to the sermon on temptation. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I find myself tempted all the time. I'm generally tempted to, one, you know, eat more food than my body actually needs to survive. Two, drive above the speed limit. Three, I'm also tempted to stay in bed and lounge around all day and do nothing. Four, sometimes I want to go to bed without brushing or flossing my teeth because I just feel too tired to do that. Five, another thing I'm tempted to do is keep all my money to myself. And six, I'm tempted to yell at the TV or computer screen when I'm watching it, watching or listening or reading the news. And this list of temptations can go on and on. And some of them I'm very good at not falling into. Others get me all the time. Temptation is such a commonplace thing in our lives that when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he included a line about lead us not into temptation. And Jesus was tempted. He knows what it feels like to be tempted with various desires for the body, the mind, and the heart. He also knows that even in the best of circumstances, totally ensconced, surrounded by security and abundance, humanity has a poor track record when it comes to resisting temptation. Scholar Chelsea, Chelsea Harmon writes this, in both the garden, the garden of Eden, and the wilderness, the devil uses God's very own words to make his temptation. The difference between how humanity and Jesus respond when facing temptation, the clear indicator of whether or not they will fail or give in to the temptation is whether or not they know the meaning of those words and trust the person behind them. Adam and Eve knew the words that God spoke, the words that commanded them not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But when the devil in the form of a serpent turned those words back to them, they did not think about God and all God had already proven to them about his care and provision for them. Instead, they thought about having more. And so even in paradise, temptation comes and we give in. An important piece of the puzzle here is that directly before this passage of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, remember Luke includes the genealogy of Jesus. And it starts with Jesus and it goes all the way back to Adam. So Adam and Eve's story is fresh on the minds of the people reading the gospel in full. As readers, we're called to compare the first temptation in the perfect environment, the Garden of Eden, to this equally important temptation in the worst conditions, the wilderness with 40 days of no food or sustenance. Right, we're humanity, we're in a constant state of high potentiality for giving in to temptations around us. Yet we see in Jesus, what we see in Jesus is standing strong in the face of temptation. Jesus may be the only human in this debate with the devil, but Jesus isn't alone. He has the word of God with him. Jesus constantly uses scripture to strengthen himself against falling for the temptations suggested to him by the devil. The very interesting thing is these three temptations that we get to hear about 
are three things that are very much within Jesus' power and glory. Because Jesus is the Son of God, all three of these things offered are already available to Jesus. Let's look at them one at a time. First up is bread. If you are the Son of Man, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. This is a double temptation, if you ask me. The very human temptation to prove what we're worth. It begins the statement with the whole if you are thing. But the real temptation and the real reason this temptation is so striking is because Jesus hasn't eaten anything while he's been out in the wilderness. And the thing is, Jesus already knows that he has the ability to perform miracles. He can transform the stone into a loaf of bread. What the devil is trying to do is get Jesus to exploit his miracle performing abilities. Jesus responds to this temptation with Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three. One does not live by bread alone. Jesus knows that he has the power to change the stone, but he also knows his power isn't there for that reason. It has a different purpose. When taking care of the physical body doesn't work, the devil leads Jesus to the temptation of earthly power. To you, I will give the glory, their glory and all authority. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus is already the Prince of Peace, already the true ruler of all kingdoms of earth. The devil wants Jesus to misuse and abuse this power by aligning himself with the devil rather than with God. Jesus responds with Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus knows he already has the ultimate power and influence over the world and doesn't need to worship, any, worship anyone besides God for that. And then finally, the devil presents Jesus a challenge to prove God's faithfulness to Jesus. The devil also uses scripture to do it. This time from the Psalms, Psalm 91 to be exact. God will command his angels concerning you to protect you. On their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. I can just imagine the devil thinking he'd beat Jesus at his own game. And that Jesus, being tempted by exploiting God's very love for him, once again responds with Deuteronomy 6.16. I can just imagine Jesus shaking his head in disgust or disdain at the misuse of scripture. Jesus doesn't feel the need to prove God's love and loyalty to him. Jesus already knows God's with him and supports him. So Jesus is fully aware of the struggle humans have with temptation because he's fully human. And he's also fully aware of the power of Almighty God and sure of his own self to not give in to these temptations. He tells us to pray and not lead us into temptation because he knows we're likely to not walk away from temptation each time. There was this study done originally in the 1970s called the marshmallow test. This is a classic study on temptation. That wasn't exactly what the researchers were categorizing and how they were categorizing their test, but it definitely shows us the power of temptation. There are videos you can search to see how this test went. Basically, the researchers tested children to see their ability to withhold pleasure now for a greater pleasure later. The adults would sit down with the children who were in the study, all individually, so one, by one at a time, and put a marshmallow on the table in front of them 
with nothing else there. The instructions were clear. I'm going to leave a marshmallow. And if you don't eat this marshmallow while I'm gone, I'll give you another marshmallow. If you do eat this one, you won't get a second one. The objective of the study was to look at willpower, impulse control, and instant gratification. This test has been done more recently and throughout the decades between the 1970s and now. And I wonder if the findings are consistent throughout the decades. And of course, that's not for this sermon, but it's just an interesting side note. The children, unsurprisingly, had a difficult time not sampling the marshmallow. They might not just pop the whole thing in their mouths, but they would touch it and smell it and stare at it and nibble a tiny piece from the marshmallow. The temptation to have the sweet treat was very real when faced with no other distractions, just the marshmallow and their thoughts. They struggled with giving in to the temptation to eat their marshmallow. And the same is true for us. We struggle to step away from our temptations. We struggle with putting off the instant gratification or excitement or power or whatever else we feel in the moment of giving in to our temptations. Our temptations are things we'd like or enjoy or want. That's why they're temptations. If you hate something and someone offers you that thing or experience or feeling, it'd be really easy to say, no, thank you. But when you really like the thing or enjoy the thing being offered, and even though you know you shouldn't accept, it's much, much more difficult to say no. We're all tempted at some point, likely even more than once a day. Even if it's a seemingly really small thing, we're all still tempted we're still moving away from the promises of God's original perfect world in Eden. It's important for us to remember that we're not alone in our temptation. Jesus was tempted too. He experienced the greatest temptation of all to show his true self, his full self at the request of the devil, only he didn't. He didn't because he knew he wasn't alone. He knew the real truth of the matter, that he is God's beloved son. And so are we. We're God's beloved children. We can hold fast to God's immense love for us, no matter what the world says to us, no matter how the devil sneaks into our world to tempt us away from God's way. As we continue to walk through Lent together, know that you're never alone. God is always with you. The Holy Spirit is right there to give you the strength to stand up against all kinds of injustice and evil. You're stronger than you think because of God's love living in and through you. You've got this. Even when you're not perfect, you got this. May you, friends, feel the power of God's living word within you whenever and wherever temptation arises. Amen.
Friends, will you now please? Oh, you can go, Mike. Go right ahead, you're on. <laughs> Friends, will you now please join me in proclaiming and affirming what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay. I'm going to go to gallery view here, and at this time we'll be checking with the good news and the hard news of our church family today. So if you have a, um, a joint concern, because we won't be looking out into the sanctuary for this day, so if you have a joint concern, please. Um, Please unmute um, yourself and, and maybe take yourself off camera for a moment so you can see who's there. Barbara? Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, it, prayers for Jack Meyer. He's in the hospital in Morristown. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Someone else? Anybody have a chat to put out or? Uh, I'll share. My father is having a surgery on Tuesday, uh, unexpected. And so just prayers for him. Uh, he's quite anxious about it. So prayers for my dad and that the surgery goes well and that he's able to recover uh, and hopefully feel quite a bit better afterwards. God of mercy. Our prayer. Rich? You're on mute, Rich. Nope, can they don't you, have one. There you go. Okay. Right now. Um, can you hear can now? You, can you hear me? Gotcha. Okay, I'm a joy. Uh, <clears throat> on uh, earlier this past week, uh, Barry Young had, had uh, car, uh, was it, cataract. Uh, cataract surgery, and I took him uh, the next day to be uh, checked out by the doctor, and he's doing great, so uh, he was very glad that he could get the patch off his eye and be able to see, and it was a blessing to spend that time with him, and, uh, and also afterwards uh, visit with Barbara. It was a great time, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks. That we really appreciated that, and he's doing better now. Yes, thank you. Out of mercy, See hear our prayers. Sensational. That is definitely a joy. Betty, I gotta unmute yourself, please. Betty, you're, you're muted. Oh, you're trying to mute. Can you type it in the chat? Oh, there, I think I got it. There we go. Okay, <laughs> okay. I just want to thank everyone for your continuing prayers and concerns over my situation. I totally appreciate it. Thank you. God of mercy, God of mercy, mercy hear our prayers. Prayer. Okay, Pastor Catherine, I'm going to mute myself. And... Sounds good. Let us pray. Gracious God, because we're not strong enough to pray as we should, you provide Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit to intercede for us in prayer. 
In this confidence, O oh God, we ask you to accept our prayers as a holy offering to your throne. Today, God, we pray for your creation. You entrusted the earth to the human race, yet we disrupt its wholeness with violence and corrupt its purity with our greed. God, prevent us from destroying what you have made and called so good so that our children's children may inherit lands and seas brimming with life and beauty. God, we also pray for the people of the world. Preserve the people of every nation from tyrants. Heal them of disease. Protect them in disaster and war and famine. Help all women, men, and children walk in the ways that lead to peace, that lead to your peace. God, we pray also today, of course, for Sussex and Wantage and the surrounding area. Protect all of our city's children and give them lives of safety, hope, and joy. We also, God, pray for our country. Give wisdom to those who govern us, to our president and our Congress people and our courts. Keep safe, God, those who protect us from danger, such as our police officers, our military, our first responders, and form us as a nation where justice flows like life-giving water. God, we also pray today for this church and church family. Strengthen all of our church leaders, our deacons, our elders, and everyone who helps in worship. Sustain them and give them the energy of your Holy Spirit so that they may give others new life and hope. Be close to those in our community who are sick and who grieve. We especially pray for Jack Meyer, who's in the hospital in Morristown. We pray for Ken Scott, Catherine's father, as he prepares for surgery on Tuesday, and then after that surgery is over, help him to heal well. We give you so much thanks, oh God, for the progress Betty has made during this hard time, and we continue to pray for her treatment and her health. We thank you for her presence in our church family. We also thank you, oh God, for the time that Rich got to spend with Barry and for the good news of Barry's cataract surgery, that it went well and that he is recovering. And we thank you for that time they got to spend together this past week. What a special bond it is to be a family of faith. Eternal God, your love is stronger than anything, including death. We rejoice in the lives of those who died in faith. Keep us in joyful communion with them until we join the saints of every nation gathered before your throne in ceaseless praise. We pray these things through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the mystery of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the triune God, and using the words Jesus taught us, we now pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is now the time in our service, friends, where we come together to offer back to God a portion of what we've been given. Jesus says, what will profit you to gain the whole world and forfeit your life? Indeed, what can we give in return for our lives? We offer back to this church a portion of what God has given us first with open hearts and hands. One second, as I pull up the PowerPoint. Would you please join me in our unison prayer of dedication? Holy God, use these simple offerings as a way to strengthen your people in this church community. Help us to stand strong in your ways and to trust in your will for us in all times. 
Bless this community by the offerings we submit into your hand today and every day. In Christ's powerful and loving name, amen. Of course, we are not in the sanctuary to physically collect any offerings today, uh, but you can feel free to mail them in or bring them with you for next week. They, we can, they can be doubly blessed next week as well. We know you are a faithful church. It is now our time uh, for communion. So for those of you who don't have your elements in front of you, uh, feel free to sneak away to grab something to partake in after we pray for our meal. Um, but I will begin by inviting you to the table. Uh, I realize I don't have this to share on the screen, but if any of you have the printed out copies, there is a, uh, a piece that is responsive. So feel free to join me on the people part if those of you don't have the bulletin in front of you. So friends, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Let those who have no money come and eat. God will satisfy our souls which are with a rich feast, and we will bless the Lord as long as we live. Friends, this is our Lord's table, and our Savior invites all those who trust in him to share in the feast which he has prepared. Please pray with me. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O oh God, our creator and redeemer. In your wisdom, you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image to love and serve you. When we were slaves in Egypt, you freed us and led us through the waters of the sea. You fed us with heavenly food in the wilderness and satisfied our thirst from desert springs. On a holy mountain, you gave us your law to guide us in your way. Through the waters of the River Jordan, you led us into the land of your promise, and you sustained us in times of trial. You spoke through prophets, calling us to turn from our willful ways to new ones of obedience and righteousness. You sent your only son to be the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you, O holy God, for you are holy, O God of majesty. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. He took upon himself the weight of our sin and carried the burden of our guilt. He shared our life in every way and though tempted was sinless to the end. Baptized as your own, he went willingly to his death and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery, to sin and death and made us a new covenant by water and the spirit. God, remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this time of bread and juice from the gifts you've given us to celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all those who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place, especially today as we are separated by our Zoom screens at our different homes. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Help us, O oh God, to be obedient to your call to love all your children, to do justice and show mercy, to live in peace with your whole creation. Guide us through the desert of life 
quench our thirst with the living waters, satisfy our hunger with the bread of heaven. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Friends, when our Lord and Savior was at table with disciples, after he given thanks, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the sign of the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. For as the apostle Paul tells us, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Come for the table is ready. Friends, the body of Christ given for you. And friends, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Please pray with me once more. We give you thanks, O God, for here at your table, you have transformed us from individuals into the body of Christ. Make us strong for your service that we may be messengers of your reconciling love for all people. Amen. It is now the time in our service where we share any announcements. And so does anyone have any announcements they'd like to share this morning for one another? Just a reminder, it's Sheila. Just a reminder that the firehouse is having their soup and sandwich today from 11 to 2. If anybody wants to come grab a sandwich and soup. Thank you for that reminder, Sheila. I really appreciate it. I'm sure they're going to have some yummy food today for people. Hopefully no squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, I have an announcement. Uh, yeah. With uh, Easter, we also come together all the churches throughout the wor world for the one great hour of sharing. Within the next few weeks, I'm gonna begin sharing with you some information regarding the one great hour of sharing. So please uh, look out for that in, in uh, about three weeks from now. Saying thank you. I also would like to make an announcement. At this point, the ladies are supposed to uh, have an in-person meeting in Fellowship Hall on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. I'm not really sure if that will have to will be able to take place, but sort of keep it out there and hopefully uh, we can let you know if it changes. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. We'll have to play things by ear. Yes, absolutely. I, uh, I, I will also give a, a message to you specifically, uh, Pastor Catherine. I really enjoyed your um, ministerial moment with us this Sunday. I really enjoyed it. And I really would like to read that, uh, that study about the marshmallow study at some given point. That interests me. And thirdly, I will be at church uh, tomorrow, uh, this afternoon when I get back home um, to chase the squirrel around. <laughs> Are there any other announcements? <laughs> okay, hearing none, I will now uh, invite us to, to join in our last hymn for the day.
friends, go out into this world knowing that no, what, no matter what temptation may meet you on the way, God is with you and you are strengthened by God's love. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.